Hello, everybody. Um, just like a quick little message out to the world uh, that in this episode, I, can you believe it, do math wrong. What? Um, it's true. And where I divide 700 by 12,600, um, I keep saying 0.06%. And I say it like, way too much to not address the fact that that's the wrong number um i forgot to move decimals around it's supposed to be six percent not 0.06 so anyway i usually wouldn't even feel the need to say this or say anything but i really i say the number so much that it, it needs to be it needs to be corrected um anyway i don't know do what you will with that have a good day drink some water you filthy little rats Oh, Christine. Uh, what? I don't know. I just wanted to beat you to, <laughs> to finally saying something, and then I didn't I didn't even come up with a witty thing. I stayed quiet. I gave you the opportunity, because um, I feel like I always start off, but uh, you did great, Em. Your first Thank time you. starting off the podcast. Well, first time ever. Well, here I go um, complimenting you again publicly about your outfit. I don't know what You're it is. You're so silly. I'm literally in like a $2 tank top. It's because I never wear tank tops. Every time I wear a tank top, Emma's like, whoa. <laughs> I, I don't know why. Because my I'm not broad like... shoulders are on display, as my mother always told me. Oh, I don't think you have broad shoulders. But I, I and I don't know why, because I'm not like, tank tops aren't like a thing for me. But like, I think because you do look different that I just notice different. I think maybe and... that's what it is. I also took a shower and forgot to take my hair out of this towel thing. So you know and was like oh it looks like an exercise day i was like no it's the opposite it's okay. i managed to shower and that's all i've done <laughs> you could tell me you just ran like 10 miles and i'd be i believe you with, i did you know i did do that i forgot to mention i did run 10 11 miles yeah um, and you bench pressed a bus so obviously yeah, I, I didn't know you knew that i watched um you did <laughs> no wonder you're all worked up i'd be too if you would bench press a bus i'd marry you on the spot hey well all right cool um no also you have like a nice all-around glow you've got a little tan going on oh thank you i uh put oil all over my face because my skin mm. is dry um Lovely. this is the week of leona's birthday Ooh. which is why i drink so i am my like in-laws are coming in tomorrow um leona's been really sick but she's better now then her teacher what did got she sick. Have? So she had roseola and blaze's first comment was like we need to get m over here to like continue <laughs> m's like list of childhood vaccinations i, I never had roseola so <laughs> uh, i mean you might have it's like very common in ki little kids i mean it's just another like fever thing mm. um but yeah so she had that it's which she's fine now but oh my god it's been crazy and then the wet or the it's my brother's birthday friday we're going to a wedding saturday leona's birthday is sunday we have like mm. 65 people coming for the birthday it's wow. gonna be a, a lot <laughs> so, oh my god it's okay i'm just trying to breathe um so anyway how are you better than you um <laughs> it's a low i bar. well i have um i've been doing a lot of extra cleaning because uh we have friends um i guess house sitting but it was it was uh, like they're not they needed a place to crash and neither of us are going to be here so we just le we're lending them our apartment but so oh, been... matt and chanel or no? yeah yeah oh nice matt and chanel. um christine only knows that because i accidentally texted her into a group chat with um... i was thrilled i was like <laughs> hey guys friends. i'm just watching you make plans <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved it, was, it it was the wrong group chat so. i felt like i was like a fly on the wall you know yeah well i uh i ended up like i ended up deciding that if they're gonna stay with us then like i have to clean the entire place right and um so i've just been like kind of running around it's like i'm doing an intense clean because i apparently turned into my mother where everything has to be like like very clean for Have them you to seen come that, over this is i hate you know people hate when i do this or when people do this but that tiktok where it's like my mom when people are coming over and she's like who's coming over like the house is a disaster and then the friend comes over and walks in and it's like 
what the fuck? Yeah, I know. What the fuck? And like freaks out. It's like, is this dust on the stairs? You haven't taken your trash out? And the mom's like, I'm sorry. I told you. I'm like, well, this is I, what moms literally think is going to happen if you invite a friend over. And, and I, I don't know why my brain is like that because Chanel has already like like stayed multiple nights here before and they've both been here for parties like it's such a real thing though like to feel like you need to make it pristine I don't know what my deal people. is like they've no, seen I'm it the dirtier way. it's like it's your home well and sherry is sleeping up here in the podcast studio mm. the haunted one yeah. and so i've had to like as you know there's like a bed in that closet yeah. And so I try to make it really cozy about like a headboard and pillows. And so I'm trying to make it nice. But like also I work up here. So it's just kind of a shit show. I had to move my my THC sodas out of the fridge. So she's not like <laughs> accidentally drinking one at night instead of a LaCroix. I'm trying to make it nice. But yeah, it is like a constant. I think I'm mess. also I think I'm more stressed because both of them will be here without me like supervising what they're looking at. And not that I think they're like Snoopy, oh, but right, I feel like, right, right. but if they're like, Oh, I wonder where this is and open the wrong cabinet yeah, or yeah. yeah, I get you. I get you. I, I will say also, um, Matt is one of the people who actually notices things. Nobody else notices. Mm-mm. Like I had, I had a housewarming party and instead of complimenting anything, I actually really, really tried on. He came up to me and was like, Oh, I really love how you did the wiring of like I love how you like organized your cords. And I'm like Okay, that's a big deal though. I noticed that too. Which like, is why I'm thing for me. Which is why I'm like, I have to wipe down the cords. Like I'm like, li- like a crazy <laughs> he's gonna look person. at those cords. He's he's been dying to see those cords again. I know it. I know. So anyway, I'm like, I know he's gonna <laughs> notice the organization. So I feel you. Anyway, that I guess that's why I drink, but I'm also traveling t- um back to the east coast again i'm like a, a little tired of it but oh my here, god yeah what are you doing yeah. on the east coast now um allison's this sister time. is getting married oh so. fun or she already got married but we're all like all getting together for like a family party oh i didn't like know a... how fun yeah congrats so, carrie i hope she doesn't mind shout outs i don't I even seen her in years Actually, she would love a shout out because when we had our Charlotte show, Allison's whole family came to the show. And I guess Carrie was standing in line to like get a T-shirt and she overheard two people in the audience talking about Allison. And they were like, they said something about like, oh, and Allison, like maybe Allison's whole family's here. And they were like trying to think if they knew Allison's family. And they said, I think she has a brother, but I think she only has a brother. And then Carrie was like, (laughs) shut the fuck up oh my god no allison has two siblings they're both lovely and um shout out carrie only yeah only yeah no she was like i I think she was like i I wanted to like stop them and tell them that i'm the sister but like i don't they would be like no you're not you liar (laughs) but so she actually she told me backstage after the show can you like somehow slip in that like allison has a sister (laughs) so here you are that was really smooth i i sort of forced that one i was like where are you going why (laughs) yeah (laughs) you're welcome carrie that was me okay you're welcome carrie so um (laughs) Anyway, that's I guess that's why I drink. I'm just I'm just, you know, aware just... of my stuff going on and that's it. So You are aware of it. That's good. Yeah, At thank least you. Someone is. Yeah. Now we are too. Um, I've got myself a story for you, Christine. <laughs> um, shall we crack into it? We shall. And you know what? You know how I just opened a liquid death uh, yeah. earlier before we even had. I just needed to. I needed something to drink. Um, I'm going to open this one now, which is my Ooh. little THC soda <laughs> since I'm trying to remove them. I'm just doing Sherry a favor and drinking them before she gets here. Oh, you generous soul. You... I know. Thank you so much for noticing. What a uh, martyr. Yeah. It only has <laughs> like dealt. I know. That's what I say about myself all the time. Um, it only has. Do you see my light freaking out all of a sudden? Oh, Uh-oh. and now it's fine. Oh, I hated that. I did not see it. I looked away at the wrong time. Sorry. Keep go, keep going. I, I want to <sighs> ignore whatever that was. Cool. Me too. Um, It has five milligrams of THC, but it's like Delta eight. So it's like the legal mild stuff. So I'm going to be drinking this throughout the show, everyone. And so mm. don't it don't be alarmed if I suddenly seem fun, real amused. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's that's a fun game. We'll all uh, keep track now of um, 
Christine's uh, you know, woo-woo levels. Well, on, on Beach Too Sandy sometimes, I will not be drinking, have anything anything abnormal and people will be like wow christine definitely got high this episode and i'm like no i didn't so i feel like it's hard to tell i don't know do you remember the first few episodes of and that's why i drink when people kept thinking we must be getting stoned before we talk and i was like <laughs> like i've literally never done that they're like christine is wasted m must be stony baloney there is no way these two bozos are sober and you totally were i was making up for it but you were totally stone cold I was just being sober. a silly goose that's all yeah that's true all right, so I have um, my notes did not go as planned. Oh my god, see mm. my light's doing it. What is just, that? What light is that? I just have a light. Ah, well, it looks like you're in a prism, like in a discotheque. Ah, um, yeah, I just had like a little light pointed on me because otherwise it's like too dark on my face. Um, but it's it's like disco out. light now. Yeah, like freaking out. Um. Okay, so I have notes that did not go as planned. I expected to go, like, really in-depth with it, and it was going to be, like, this huge deep dive. But go figure, all of it was, like, pretty classified. <laughs> so, oh, go figure. Um, And some of it is released to the public, but they didn't, like, really help with the notes. It, so I wanted to – this the topic, the topic is um, Project Blue Book. Yes. Which, oh, shut up. Oh, I was hoping you'd say that. But I always, I wanted it to be more like, let me tell you about the experiments and let me tell you about the nitty gritties. And, right. But it, it kind of just turned into like, um, I don't know. It just didn't go as planned. I thought I was going to be doing more of a tell all. Uh. And nothing, nothing I found really told all, you know? <laughs> and so, well. um, this this is kind of cool though. Then you can do like an introductory chapter one or like one hundred and one on Blue chap, uh, Project Blue Book, and then like in a few years or something, we can do like now the deep dive we've all been waiting for. Now that we've graduated from one hundred and one. Yes, I agree. I think this is okay. that's a perfect way to put. It. This is one hundred and one, cool. and then if I can find my way into a Which, deep like, dive, I I'll don't do even it. have one hundred and one knowledge. So like I need one hundred and one first. I feel like before You're a deep dive anyway. You're so good at hyping me up when I'm like feeling I, listen, blue about something. by just like insulting my own intelligence. That's what I do. <laughs> no, I felt so do. bad because I I really wanted this to be like QAnon. Let me tell you like every single oh, thing they did and found and like it. I want I expect it to be like a two parter and you know. I'll be honest. I feel like it will be nice for everyone to have a one on one for like first. You know to just sure. get because most of us probably don't know. Easing you in, even easing even you in. the even the beginning of it. Okay, thank you, Christine. I appreciate so that. Welcome. So, um, okay, Project Blue Book. It was the code name for the 1952 Air Force program looking into UFOs and extraterrestrial life. Mm. Do, 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 do. Um, oh, I wish I had the button. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I. I wish I installed that on our machine so we could just start <laughs> pressing that more often. But. Do, 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 do. Um, so did you know, I did not know this. I thought this was super fun. And this will be an episode that I cover if I, I can... literally, the way you said that, I thought you were about to say, and this will be on the test. I was like, oh, oh no, no. <laughs> said, and this will be. And I was like, shit, I don't have a pencil. <laughs> can I borrow a pen? That was me. Can I borrow a pen? Can I borrow a paper? Can I, I borrow literally... a chair? I didn't bring anything to school. I forgot everything at home. Me either. How on earth did I go through? I never, ever had a pen ever. And ever. even if I brought a pen to class i'd probably throw it in the trash just so i could sit down and be like can i have a pen oops and then somebody would be like can i have my pen back and i'm like i don't have your pen and they're like i literally gave you seven last week and i'm like (laughs) well i'm sorry they're gone i don't know what you gave me a pen that was your fault um also can i tell you one thing really quickly i'm sorry it's such a Mm -hmm. sidebar but i totally meant to mention it as the reason i drink and i totally forgot and it's that i was at the bengals game yesterday who day they won and uh i brought my dad and i was with blaze and my sister and uh I ordered a Bud Light and I had, I hadn't, I was going to say I'd forgotten to tell Blaze. It wasn't that I'd forgotten. I didn't want to tell Blaze that I had lost my driver's license while he was out of town and (laughs) I can't, I can't find it. It's been like two weeks. It's on the ground somewhere at a bar. So (laughs) it's literally on the ground, not even at a bar. It's like probably at a Michael's craft store or like somewhere (laughs) so boring and stupid. And I was like, I was so embarrassed to tell him. So I brought my passport. I've been carrying my password around for two weeks to be like, oh, in case I need uh, an ID. And so I was at the stadium and I was like, I'm going to order a Bud Light because I'm feeling a little (laughs) wild and crazy. So I ordered a Bud Light and they're like, can I see an ID? And I was like, of course. I opened my passport 
No. It's Leona's passport. Oh and they're my like, God. I literally just hold it up and they're like, that's a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh my god, I look so young, don't I? <laughs> I was like, thank you. <laughs> That's a baby who's not even two. And I was like, oh my lord. And I was so mortified. And then Blaze is like, why are you carrying that around? I was like, oh, I just I grabbed it by accident. He's like, well, then show your driver's license. I was like, uh-huh. I don't. It's somewhere <laughs> in the world. <laughs> anyway, so then I had to make Blaze buy me my beer, which was very embarrassing. And um, I I basically whipped out the passport and literally when she looked at me and said that's a baby i was like what are you talking about um so i basically have been carrying around my infant my toddler daughter's passport as a form of (laughs) official government identification for two weeks um i forget why i mentioned this you were saying something oh about losing my pens this is just like kind of like blaze was so frustrated but like he was like, I'm not mad at you. And I'm like, you know, I know, you're just mad at life. <laughs> when we were younger and even before that, more like the in the 80s, there was that uh, that PSA that came on at 10 o'clock every night to be like, where, where are, are your, your children? <laughs> where are I'd your like, children? <laughs> Which like, on the by floor the... somewhere in a Michael's craft store, probably. <laughs> you definitely, we need to bring that back just so we can be like, where are your important documents? Where is your driver's license? Where is your birth certificate right now? I um, mean, it's so more, like and the fact that I thank God I found out like in such a low stakes environment like imagine if I was out and I needed an ID like I got pulled over or something and I'm like oh well I mean I guess I need to have my driver's license for that event anyway so uh, you know what I, I, let's not think about it that's what I do I compartmentalize do you still don't have your ID no I have no idea where it is but don't tell Blaze yet because I will find it eventually I think it really will get... come up in a way where you like people are talking around you and you'd spot it and you can't even rejoice you're just gonna have to act like you always knew it was right there Oops. and then put it back in your pocket maybe I'll go back to the craft store I swear it's probably there <laughs> I don't know honestly where at this point I don't know how I mean wow this could get so bad so quickly about like government surveillance but like how are there not like like tags or something a little geotag on it i need to like tape one to it maybe that's probably insane you need to put like an air tag tape an air tag to your id (laughs) i think i do um i think that's a good idea Em. i'm gonna do that and you know people would say put it in your wallet well i do have an air tag in my wallet my wallet's here my id is gone so you know what that didn't help me any um anyway i'm so sorry to just barge in with my stupid story but um it's okay while we're while we're barging it's literally people like oh my god we got one bullet in but (laughs) i keep wanting i keep wanting us to say this and we keep fucking forgetting what we should catch people up on where we are with the tour (laughs) oh yeah only because people are not said anything (laughs) we haven't said anything and now it's fucking october oopsie okay so uh i only want to bring it up just because people have to be wondering what's going on um because we said we would be having fall dates and again it's fall and we're not touring um so we had uh a bit of a miscommunication when it came to like figuring out venues and stuff like that and it things just didn't work out things just didn't work out in time so we are going back out on tour but we're going back out on tour in the spring so we're taking a hiatus for the fall and yes but we are still doing the same content otherwise we would have announced to you guys like the location and how it went and like talked about the tour more Um, right but but we're keeping it under wraps still for for the shows that haven't seen it yet exactly so we're only halfway through our tour we're just taking a very big break in between but not as big as covid so that's (laughs) right so you're not allowed to complain (laughs) Um, so um we will be back in spring which it will be you know wide range between january and probably may but then we don't even know what cities yet so we're still waiting on the um information and this is uh, as we approach october so yeah we'll be uh we'll be releasing that as soon as we have it we just haven't gotten it yet um and also just in case you are missing us so much um alexander and i will be in pittsburgh and nashville on november 8th and 9th so if you want to come see us you can Boom. Boom. boom bang bang boom okay i've been wanting to say it for like easily the last 10 episodes and then i always remember remember. after we record so i never remember anyway sorry to everyone who's been like wondering what's going on but you have deserved a psa for quite some time yes yes that's true hey christine i've got a story for you it's called project blue book um oh cool should we do is it a deep dive is it no i'm just kidding just explain all that again (laughs) okay 
the first and last bullet I left you on was uh, that it's a code name for the Air Force, uh, an or Air Force program in 1952 that was looking into UFOs and extraterrestrial life. Right, right. Fun fact, because it didn't even occur to me, uh, people since the late 1800s have been claiming to see UFOs. Ooh, probably earlier, but it's been documented around in the U.S. at least since the late 1800s. Cool. Um, which before 1950, like it doesn't even occur to me they would have known what uh, what, like you know what I mean? Like it blows my mind. Yeah, it's interesting too because I feel like back in the 1800s it would have been a lot. Like there's no such thing as like a plane or a helicopter in the sky like so the lights must have been very alarming back then which is why they at the time called them airships because they Uh, literally thought they were flying ships like ocean ships (laughs) oh my god i never even thought about that weird but yeah they like didn't know really any other vehicles so they were like it's it's a ship in the air sure of course which that blew my mind too i'm like it's so funny how language works where it's like they were so limited to only knowing yeah, one thing. you use what you know. Exactly. Oh, that's pretty genius, Em. Wow. Uh, so this is something that if I can find enough notes on will be the what I cover next week. Um, but I found out then in 1896 and 1897, there was actually a mass hysteria throughout the country because a bunch of people started reporting strange lights in the air, mysterious crafts, and cigar-shaped flying <gasps> boats. Oh my god. So there was a whole means. I it means I might be covering it. So Yeah, a good story from M. <laughs> so that was in the 1890s. And what's interesting about it is people really didn't know what to do about it and they weren't even thinking about aliens because my first thought if i see a ufo is alien but they were just seeing flying boats and were just amazed by the technology it didn't even occur to them that it would be uh, you know extraterrestrial life different planet right right like yeah like aliens wasn't even on their mind it was just how is something flying yeah um so people were seeing the crafts but not necessarily connecting them to aliens um but I'll, I'll, if I can find a lot of information on that, I'll cover it next week. So in 1947, here's another fun fact for you. There was a pilot named Kenneth Arnold, and he was flying a plane near Mount Rainier in Washington. And all of a sudden, he saw nine objects fly between mountain peaks at impossible speeds. He, he estimated that they were flying at at least 1,000 miles an hour. And oh, my Lord. Something very, very impossible in 1947. Yeah. And he reported it and told the media. And when he was talking to the media, he said they flew like a saucer would if you were skipping it across a, across water. <gasps> Interesting. Um, and the media ran with that. And that is how we got flying saucer. Oh, shit. I didn't even see it coming. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and so he actually later reported that, like, he doesn't like he didn't mean to say it looked like a flying saucer it was just it flew like a saucer if you like frisbeed it essentially yeah that's Um, interesting how that would stick and like just that one turn of phrase would become the entire concept yeah wow and apparently he had um when he said it it was at the beginning of like uh the mass ufo hysteria of the 1950s and so by the time he talked about it in the media, six weeks later, 90% of Americans had heard the term flying saucer. Holy shit. Isn't that, was that crazy? That big of a, that's crazy. I didn't realize that was such a big And to think only like story. 60, 70 years later, all of us, 90% of Americans would hear that like UFOs are real and none of us yeah, would give a shit. From the <laughs> government. <laughs> yeah. And be like, uh, oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, next. Exactly. It's like, okay. Um, <laughs> so after his report, UFOs, especially flying saucers, those sightings exploded. Um, okay. This is where we get the modern idea of aliens taking off. And uh, mm. the concept of UFOs is now so big in the world at this time that people are starting fan clubs and investigative journals and um, search teams. So... This is the UFO craze uh, when we start seeing all this stuff. And in 1947, it was also the time that it was the start of the Cold War. World War II had just ended. 
and ideas of like these big massive scary nuclear weapons like a bombs mm. were you know sputnik they were hot topics yeah so many people believed that ufos were not related to aliens but they were actually military crafts or they were soviet spies oh, and so, i was gonna say there was so much talk about spies too and like not trusting people so yeah that makes sense yeah it was like definitely um a time where there was a lot of new technology and i don't think people were immediately thinking aliens they were just thinking right this is government military equipment that is so advanced and we like classified and yeah. yeah 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 so um plenty of people thought it could be aliens and a lot of people thought it could be aliens and the military like collabing together like they, <laughs> they thought like global militaries working with aliens who had like more advanced technology and so there and was a like, lot well, of which side are the aliens on are they on our side exactly oh so there was a lot of um distrust and a lot of fear and a lot of awareness that technology was, you know, exploding. I mean, in 1947, a lot of people who were living at that time lived in a time before cars. And now all of a sudden there are things flying in the fucking air. And there's... Fair point. They've seen quite a jump technology-wise. And, yeah. you know, so yeah. I think they're just like, yeah, things are booming and I don't know which way is up. So yeah, uh, many... U.S. leaders were also really worried because they didn't know what was out there. They knew what we were capable of, but for all they knew, the Soviet spies had something mm. else. And so as the UFO fever spread and was kind of overlapped with, you know, the distrust in the military or fear for, you know, the Cold War, um, the military made plans to officially investigate UFO sightings because a lot of the leaders didn't even know what was going right. on. Right. So in 1948, it didn't start as Project Blue Book. It started as Project Sign, S-I-G-N, Sign. Okay. And it was launched uh, in near Dayton, Ohio, at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. That's where my mommy works. At that Air Force Base? Yeah, Wright State University is like on, well, it's like affiliated, so um, a lot Ooh. of military. Yeah, and I, it listen, it just adds to how weird Ohio is, all the... There's a lot of sightings up in Dayton by the uh, Wright Pat really? Air Force Base. Yeah. Wright Pat. Ooh. Wright Ooh. Pat. Yeah. <laughs> Wright Pat. Go. Uh, oh, shit. Go. Uh, Go oh, Planes. <laughs> Go Orville. Go <laughs> Aliens. What are they called? Oh, no. I'm like, this is so bad. My brother and my sister and my mom all went there. Uh, oh, the Raiders. Rowdy Raiders. The Go Rowdy Raider. Raiders. Rowdy Raiders. I love the I love the word rowdy. I do too. Oh, it's a good one. It's a good one. Some words just just roll Some right just out of you. Work, you know. Rowdy raiders. That's fun. That's right. <sighs> so, <Shut> <laughs> so in um, so they created Project Sign in 1948, and okay. in the and it was to investigate like all these sightings that people were seeing like are they aliens is it military we don't know about like what's the deal and in yeah. the end project sign didn't actually find any compelling evidence that it was extraterrestrials um piloting ufos but a year later project sign evolved into a different project called project grudge oh that's scary and i wonder how they pick the names yeah you know? what the fuck explain yourself please That's it's gotta a be scary like when name. you when you name like hurricanes how there's like an order to it the you know? alphabetical yeah so i wonder like are you know and also hurricanes when they're alphabetical why do they only pick a certain name like okay we've got e and they just like they just like pick a They're random like, e name Eleanor. or yeah. is there like a like a certified e name you have to rock you know, with? i don't know but i think they're supposed to switch the quote-unquote gender of the name mm -hmm. isn't that true i, don't I know. think so it's boy girl boy girl boy girl yeah i think okay Patriarchy. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so heteronormative so, these fucking hurricanes honestly it's actually like pretty feminist it's honestly, very equal i'm offended oh <laughs> I mean, I, I'll still be offended. That's fine. I'm this sure. Is easier. I'm, uh, yeah. Okay. You're right. I'm mad. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. You're right. I'm mad. <laughs> so in 1949, sign evolved into grudge, which does feel more masculine. Um, yeah. What the fuck? 
<laughs> but it once again found no compelling evidence of any extraterrestrials, and so the project kind of ended in 1951. But then the oh, next okay. year, Sign and Grudge would both become Project Blue Book, which is now the longest mm-hmm. running and best known, um, best known publicized now, yeah. um, you know, investigation into UFOs. And Project Blue Book was officially active between 1940 or no 1952 to 1969. So that's, what, 17 years? And it was headed by Air Force Captain Edward J. Ruppelt. And the astronomer, I always, I don't know why I always mess up his name, but it always throws me off, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Um, he is a, he he's known, he's been, I've been talking, I've talked about him a lot in other stories, either UFOs. I think he actually like also jumped on the Mothman train. Oh. Um, but he was a UFO research consultant to the Air Force at this time, and he became the lead scientist on Project Blue Book. So he's like the man when it comes to, you know, aliens, UFOs, all that good stuff. Space boats. Space boats. And <laughs> Dr. Hynek worked for Ohio State. He worked for uh, John Hopkins. Oh, H. I can do what? all the I can do all the fun. What's Ohio State's um, I O? Oh, I O. Buckeyes, baby. All right, the rowdy Buckeyes. I'm not, or? I'm not really an Ohio State fan. I my Renee went to their law school, but that's my that my affiliation ends there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Before anybody's like, how dare you? I uh, people take this shit seriously. Do you have a Do you have a team you like, or is it the Rowdy Raiders? I gotta say, it's probably the Rowdy. Ra- listen, I love the Louisville. No, the, the that's not even the right town. I love the <laughs> the y'alls, the Florence y'alls. Oh, I love the team. Florence y'alls. Okay, that's my team. Oh, Let's good leave it for at you. that. <laughs> Have you been to any of their games? I haven't, but I really want to. It always conflicted with bedtime, but I think like next summer we'll be able to go finally. It'd be fun. Leona would have a great time. That's what I'm thinking. They have a lot of family nights and stuff. So, oh, yeah. imagine her with like a little like a bunch of ketchup and mustard all over her face from a hot dog. Oh, oh. I don't need to imagine that. That's a daily <laughs> occurrence. <laughs> okay, but for me, it's glamorized, and yeah, for I'm you, like all it's about adorable. it. <laughs> oh wow! I would love to go to a Florence y'all's game with can her. Can you come we'll, and we'll go? We'll, have, we'll have matching jerseys. We'll have matching. Jerseys. That can be like your guys's activity, you know. Yeah, every time Funko M comes to town, we go to a Florence Y'all's game. That's so fun. Yeah. And we'll both anyway. have ketchup and mustard all over our faces. It'll be a great time. And that'll be adorable for me. Not. It'd be so fun. And then I'd be like, Christine, you have to wipe my face, too. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, I'll wash both your faces. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Um, where were we? Where were we? Where were we? Oh, so, oh, Dr. Heine, he works for Ohio, Ohio State. State. He worked for John Hopkins. He worked at the Harvard College Observatory and the Navy Whoa. and the Air Force. So um, he NBD. was quite an academic. And he was famously responsible for the Heineck scale, which we talked about in past episodes. Yeah. But it's um, he was also the the one who, by the way, he thought that UFO craze would die out like hula hoops. Do you remember us talking about that? That's right. Yes, I absolutely do, because we went, of course, on the craziest tangent about that. Yes, yes, yes. So a um, quick review on the Heineck scale. It is uh, the list of different types of close encounters. So yes. it's, okay. a, do you want me to tell you what they are? Or you want to guess what they are? Sure. I, so, I know. F- a, yeah, you, you tell me. The, the close encounter of the first kind. Do you know what that is? The first kind is just seeing a UFO, right? Wow, you're so smart with your big fat brain. Look at that. <laughs> Do you like that I tilt my head like a dog? I'm like, did I do it right? (laughs) (laughs) So, yes, the first, the encounter, a close encounter of the first kind is seeing a UFO at five to 600 feet away or less. Okay. Um, So that's, that's scary enough. Five to 600 feet away. That seems a lot. Yeah. I like certainly too close. Um, So it's because at that range, the witness can make out considerable details. Mm. Um, A close encounter of the second kind do you know what that is? Is that seeing an extraterrestrial? No, in the middle. It's when there's an alleged presence. So like they can, there's oh. signs that something was there. So scorch marks, like an aircraft oh. was there or okay. raised radiation levels, malfunctioning electronics, animals acting weird, us feeling weird. Um, and then the third encounter is when you actually see a, an entity. Mm, okay. So that can be either someone piloting the UFO or making physical contact with them. Ugh. 
And then later they added on the fourth kind, which was abductions. <laughs> They're like, I guess we need one more step, which is the worst of all. Isn't that wild, though, that when the, the scale first came out, it didn't even occur to them that something would take us? Oh, so scary. You know, the first time someone got taken, they were like, oh, shit, let's be like, what kind is this? You didn't warn (sighs) me about this. Our scale is not made for that. Um, Three and a half. Right. So Dr. Hynek was um, actually a noted skeptic, and he aimed to evaluate the cases with an open mind. But I think he went into each of them probably trying to debunk it. Yeah. And by this time, there were many more public panics about UFOs. This is still in. um, What year is this? I think this is 50 two-ish it's like cold war times yeah um there's still a lot of public panics for like probably the last five years now about ufos and the air force uh, started having like hold press conferences that like everything's good it's not an alien like everyone stop freaking the fuck out but that's helpful <laughs> but stop the- freaking out it's not <laughs> aliens we're just studying it in the background don't worry about it yeah and so at the same time they're like it's not aliens from project sign they said there's no sign of extraterrestrials project grudge said there's no sign of extraterrestrials but even then as like government intel they're like okay so if it's not extraterrestrials what the fuck is it yeah and so they're trying to calm people down about aliens while also being very scared that it's something like not american and freaking people out and this is during the cold war and so the director of air force intelligence he said that um He said that almost every sighting had been explained. This was during a press conference. He said that almost every sighting has been explained, and the ones that haven't been explained, the Air Force is looking into. And he said some sightings were, quote, made by credible observers to relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we are now attempting to resolve. So he was at least saying, like, there are things that we can't explain. We'll acknowledge that. Okay. But we are looking into it. Thank you. That's so nice. Um, at the same time, he was saying it's, uh, he said it's not alien or it's not, you know, it's not, you know, intergalactic, um, but we don't know what it is. And then he also told the nation that, uh, none of the sightings seemingly posed a threat. So like we should be fine, but also they weren't quote connected to any secret development by any agency of the United States. So he was like. I would like to say it was it's a government thing and we can't talk about it, but even we don't know what's going on. Oh, no, that's not comforting. Sorry. Yeah, so it's like comforting in one way where he's like, don't worry, it's not this thing, but also it it could be this thing. But also um, we're a little scared too. It's like, uh, we don't want to know that. Yeah, and during the height of like the, the Cold War, so like everyone's freaking out. Um, and at this point, the military seemed less interested in figuring out aliens and they were more interested in like, what the hell are these machines up in the sky so more than aliens the cia was worried about the soviet union and not only that but they were worried that the soviet union was going to use this ufo hysteria to their advantage and like use that as a tactic Mm. to to get us so they thought that the the soviet union would um use the many reports like sighting reports to induce mass hysteria and like spread propaganda oh jeez and they were also scared that the soviet intelligence might actually uh, overwhelm their air warning systems with false UFO reports to distract the military from an actual aerial attack. Oh shit. So they're like, this is a weakness now in wartime. Yeah. They were like, they're just oh, going no. to, they're going to be calling in so many UFO sightings, even if they're fake, just to like oh, no. distract us when there's like, they're actually flying in their own planes and we won't hear about it. Right, right, right. And it became a matter of national security to end this UFO craze. Um, and, by the way, the UFO craze is sometimes called the saucer era, which I love. Ooh. Um, I learned that too. And I was like, oh, I how, like that. S- how saucy. It is saucy. Um, I almost said that. I was like, Christine, shut up. So I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> so the goal in investigating UFO sightings officially became not trying to find aliens, but to debunk them and to end America's fascination with them. So that way the Soviet Union intelligence couldn't use it against us interesting okay that's why i said that that. the the notes changed because i was expecting to do this whole tell-all and it ended up being me (laughs) finding out that project blue book wasn't all about aliens like i wanted it to be (laughs) right it was more about russia (laughs) yeah (laughs) um and so it uh yeah it changed so after debunking 
uh, they haven't debunked yet, but the goal of Project Blue Book became trying to debunk these UFO sightings uh, in general, not just as aliens, but debunk I see. what they are. And then the goal was to educate the public on aircrafts and natural phenomena to explain away any future sightings. So that way, instead of calling in about it to keep the, the airwaves clear, they could just know enough about airships to be able to determine if it was really a UFO they saw. Oh, okay. I got you. So according to declassified CIA documents, the uh, propaganda campaign involved, quote, using the mass media, advertising, business clubs, schools, and even even the Disney Corporation to get the message across. <gasps> now that sounds very dystopian. Like we I, I had to bring Disney on board. <laughs> Walt Disney was probably like, oh my God, like I'm so important. Look how special I am that the He's government really like, needs me. It's my me. time to shine, baby. So, like, I wonder Down if, with the communists. That means at some point, did, like, the CIA come to, like, fucking Disneyland and, like, talk to him about animating planes more? Like, I wonder if we go back and look at that oh, time. There's a shift in the animation. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Um, oh, Em, I like that thought, though. But, I mean, hey, they were trying to do mass media to teach everybody about aircrafts and natural right. phenomena. So, but also, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um... So it was also recommended that uh, civilian UFO organizations should be watched closely because of their ability to influence people on their own with their own theories. So this is when they try to make people f sound crazy for. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very uh, gaslighty. It, truly. It, the goal was to undermine any UFO research <sighs> until the public became uh, so over UFOs and that they thought that UFOs were nothing but like nonsense. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so rude. <laughs> so like even these like really intense civilian organizations who are trying really, really hard that and like makes me off and maybe are even on like the brink of discovering something. Yeah. They're like being either shut down or like, like, um, I'm some offended. other competitive <laughs> propagandas coming out, like rival propaganda to like say otherwise. <sighs> so I understand what they were trying to do because it was a national security threat, but also like there are people out there actually trying to study this and now you've just shut all of it down. Yeah. Um, and now you make them all look crazy and it's going to take decades for people to take them seriously again. Mm hmm. And so mm -hmm. as blue book continued, the CIA's interest in UFOs started to fade and officials were trying to pass off their responsibility to other departments. Mm -hmm. Um, because I guess the, I guess their propaganda worked and people started not caring as much. And so they were like, well, now right. it's not, of you know utmost importance so however in 1956 the former head of project blue book that captain edward ruppelt he published the report on un unidentified flying objects and in this report on ufos edward references the estimate of the situation which is this uh, we've the only person who's ever talked about it and has claimed to see it is this guy um okay but the estimate of the situation is this alleged official report on the findings of that very early project sign and which they actually found that extraterrestrials are real and they just covered it up. Oh, okay. so when, so when project sign originally came out and then they announced publicly like, Oh, we haven't found anything that says anything about extraterrestrials and it almost disbanded and then it got restarted to be grudge and grudge also didn't find anything. He's now saying that there's a section called the, there's this report called the estimate of the situation that says that was a total lie and they just covered it up and <gasps> extraterrestrials are very real. Um, and according to his book, higher ups condemned the report and ordered all copies go to the incinerator to destroy it. And then to mm. publicly announce that extraterrestrials were not found during project sign. What the fuck? To this day, there's no evidence of the estimate of the situation beyond Edwards' claims. So okay. we'll never know. But he was, like, in charge of Project Blue Book. So, um, Man, I wish I he had know. just, like, kept one, stuffed it, stuffed it down his pants and was like, yep, incinerator. I know. I just <laughs> on. Like, I would, I would just wish. I wonder how many times, though, someone in the government has tried to do that to be, like, a whistleblower and... It, it like it's got found out like i mean it must be a really scary thing to try and pull off yeah i mean i'm sure like if 
you had that kind of information and you like strapped one to your like your thigh or something and then tried walking yeah. away they'd probably kill you be like you're you're, you're a you. national threat to security you're a threat now yeah oh geez so uh to this day there is no evidence of the estimate of the situation however the book ignited major controversy and demands for the military to declassify any ufo investigations they've done Right. And the public pressure got so intense that even the FBI started investigating reporters. Ooh. And in 1966, the Air Force announced that it was forming a contract to create an official investigative report, which would be available to the public. So um, and this was they worked with the University of Colorado, who took what is today a three million dollar contract with the Air Force mm. to conduct an 18 month long study of flying saucer reports. Whoa. OK. Physicist Dr. Edward Condon uh, headed the program, and he was saying that the uh, he said that the existence of flying saucers are improbable but not impossible. So he was very interested in being a part of this. And in 1969, the program ended up releasing what their findings. And their findings were called the scientific studies of unidentified flying objects. But because Dr. Edward Condon was in charge of all of this. That uh, same report, the Scientific Studies of Identified Flying Objects, is also known as the Condon Report. Ah, uh, okay. I have heard of that. Yeah, I think we talked about that a couple episodes ago. Yeah, you've mentioned that, I think. And so the Condon Report is, you'll, this will jog your memory, it was almost 15,000 pages long. Uh, that's, yep, I already remember. I'm like, what the fuck? And it had 37 contributing scientists. And the whole thing covered five categories, which, what's that, 3,000 pages each? Um, Jesus. <laughs> That's crazy. These are the categories that it covered. Old UFO reports from before 1966. New mm. reports since 1966. Photographic cases. Radar and visual cases. And then UFOs reported by astronauts. Oh, interesting. Okay. And Condon himself stated that 21 years of investigation um, had produced no conclusive evidence of extraterrestrials and no further research was needed. Um, and, I and call a special, bullshit. I call bullshit, too. <laughs> it was like, yeah, oh, who are you? Project Sign? Okay. Oh, who are you? 15,000 pages? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine writing 15,000 pages and not a single lick of that being evidence of extraterrestrials and then some of my some dumbass on a podcast is like i don't believe any of your fifteen thousand pages <laughs> i know so like, take that I'm like all the, like, all the hard work you put into I it mm, i don't want to acknowledge mm, any of it you're wrong <laughs> <laughs> i'm such an ass i know um so there's a special panel that formed by the national academy of sciences and they reviewed the report and declared Quote, on the basis of present knowledge, the least likely explanation of UFOs is a hypothesis of extraterrestrial visitations mm. of intelligent beings. So okay. they sided with the Condon Committee. Mm. And uh, both of them, the Condon Committee and the National Academy of Sciences, both recommended pulling the plug on further investigations. I feel like, because I'm apparently a conspiracy theorist and all this, I feel like someone held a gun to their head and said, you close this fucking investigation you down and don't let them. anyone know. That's exactly right, Em. I guarantee I it. I, I, you know what? <laughs> I don't guarantee it. I don't guarantee not, it. But... Not, a sh not a shed of doubt on my mind. Not a single shred, no. So in December of 1969, the Secretary of the Air Force announced the official termination of Project Blue Book. And mm. according to National Archives... Between 1947 and 1969, so the entirety of Project Sign all the way to the end of Project Blue Book. Right. During that time, Project Blue Book looked into 12,618 UFO sightings. 12,600. Wow. And only 701 of them remain unexplained, which to mm. me, that's 700 fucking cases we that are unexplained. We talked about that, I think. And we did. We We've saying... talked about this before. Yeah, and we're saying just and which I, Jim Harold always says, which I love, like just one has one story has to be true. Just one ghost has to be real for yeah. it to all be real to for it to be possible. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, that's yeah. I'm right on board with you. Seven hundred is a lot more than one. 
I will say 700 out of 12.6 thousand, though, is only 0.06%. Oh, it is, it is a lot smaller than it <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It doesn't feel all that big anymore. But So only 0.06% of UFO sighting cases in that entire time, during the like mass hysteria, people looking into the sky mm. every day, only 0.06% are unexplained. So... And that, by the way, again, me being a conspiracy theorist, that's what they want you to think. So That's what um, they want you to think. Exactly right, Em. So many do believe that thousands of the explained cases, which is, this is where I fall, a lot of people think that of the thousands that were explained, they weren't investigated fairly. Um, so they were just kind of slapped with the label people of explained. like weather balloon. Yeah. Basically, and so, like swamp gas. Even there was an article in Popular Mechanics where an author named Mark McConnell or Mark O'Connell, he said it was a rigged game because Blue Book investigators investigators were under constant pressure to debunk and explain away any and all UFO mm. reports. Um, the worst sin one could commit on the Blue Book staff was to mark a case unexplained. So, oh wow! So you it was just intense. Like there was an um, ulterior motive here, and you were supposed to be following protocol yeah and i don't and it could have been because people didn't want to create more mass hysteria so don't label it a ufo or right. hey we really need this explained because otherwise we as a military need to be worried about what the fuck this is because it could right. be you know it, they, so they could be after us research this but you better not find anything exactly like, well shit <laughs> exactly it reminds me a lot of um when i covered snippy the horse and like this was like a, a oh, horse yeah. that was like like I think he, I don't even remember the story anymore, but he was like mutilated in some way. There was it was Ugh. there were scorch marks. There was like yes, weird goo was everywhere. But investigators still they couldn't come up with an explanation, so they just called it solved. Like it was like what the fuck? Like how is that solved and not a UFO? So um, it reminds me of that where there's like something glaring in front of you that like yeah. something's off, and they just closed the case because they didn't want to deal with it. So that's um, infuriating. So, yeah, there were, you know, only 0.06% were not explained, but the rest of them that were, like, right. there were probably a lot of Snippy the Horses in there where it was very <laughs> oh, clearly, <laughs> very clearly alien, and they were like, nope. They were like, so, sorry, just a dead horse, just another dead horse. Just another dead horse with, like, an alien sign branded into with it. Goo um, all over it. <laughs> yeah. So, eventually, Dr. Hynek, who uh, created the Hynek scale, he and he was also in charge of Project Blue Book at one point. Eventually, he speaks critically on Project Blue Book, and he said that there wasn't a fair effort to investigate the cases with an open mind. So he is validating this theory. Mm, interesting. And he said the entire operation was a foul up based on the categorical premise that the incredible things reported could not possibly have any basis in fact. So um, he so ends up biased becoming, from the start, basically. Yes, That's thousand percent. Bullshit. He became a fierce advocate for true scientific study into the UFO problem. Love and it. he said that they all really deserved genuine scientific consideration. But as he really got into this world of UFOs and he advocated for more research on them, universities mm -hmm. ended up becoming embarrassed by their association with him. Um, which like in my mind, I'm like, you're embarrassed that he once scientific study methods to be in place whatever yeah he probably was labeled as like a kook you know yes i think so. so and he ended up retiring from academia altogether just to go into studying ufos oh, um, wow. and on being a consultant on military research he said i started almost as a complete skeptic because i thought the whole thing was a question of post-war nerves but it was the mm. persistence of the phenomenon and it refused to dry up and blow away and that finally led me to the belief that there we had a real phenomenon to deal with what a smart guy like i feel like it takes a lot to like have a conviction like be so skeptical and then like turn that around based on the yeah. evidence like that's really a big move i feel like especially for like a 1950s man to like admit you were yeah, wrong or to be like yeah i don't think that uh yeah yeah th i don't think i was right that's i'm impressed he ended up saying that the term flying saucer was quote most unfortunate because it opens the door to a great deal of buffoonery i love to use the word buffoonery <laughs> sorry that's the best word i ever heard <laughs> there's the rowdy raiders the and rowdy the, buf <laughs> and the buffoonery buckeyes 
not. You're 100 percent right. It's beautiful. <laughs> He believed that the imagery of the flying saucer made UFOs seem silly and prevented witnesses from coming forward for fear of ridicule. Yeah, which that's true. That's fair. Um, And Dr. Hynek said that uh, it's witnesses. uh, He said that people who have seen UFOs, if you're listening, essentially, it is your scientific duty to share your experiences so that way we have a compilation of reports um and he stated that the reports uh any, anyone who reported to him it would be anonymous so if you're mm. afraid of being ridiculed i just want all the stories so i can look into them i love that i love that in 1986 dr Heineck died and uh he died still an adamant advocate that mm. uh we needed scientific study and further attention to ufos and years later an official statement said that there hasn't been any new reasons to resurrect the UFO investigations from the air force. Mm. Um, they, they literally said there's no reason to go back into looking into UFOs because of the quote, steadily decreasing defense budget, which, um, (laughs) God. Let me remind you that the U S has the largest military and defense budget in the entire world. Uh, it has, uh, more than the, other nine top spending countries combined yeah. Yeah, and i think it's they horrifying in 2020 they spent 778 billion dollars on military billion. and defense expenses billion with a b so like she's fine like i can't believe someone is saying like oh but it's steadily decreasing We're next so broke next it's year like, it might be 777 billion oh yeah, fucking no rocket money on the case because they will tell you you're mismanaging your money okay government I- Exactly. And for them also to be saying like, oh, well, we can't afford it to look into investigations. We don't even know if aliens are real. Uh, Let's travel back about six months ago when Mm. we started finding out that in recent congressional hearings on UFOs where government officials are straight up saying aliens are real. I've looked them in the eyes. I have worked with them. I've spoken with them. I had keys to area 51 the things that i've seen your brain wouldn't even be able to process Ser- uh, I mean, they're dangerous they could hurt us thank god they've been nice so far i've seen people die at the hands of them and also uh, the, we just got that weird little picture of a spirit halloween alien skeleton or whatever that was we've all seen it now that there's they are showing little aliens that i mean it's 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 on c-span like i can't get more <laughs> like <laughs> Fuddy duddy, boring news, you know. C sp- no offense to all the C SPAN <laughs> lovers out there, but like, come on. This isn't like, oh, TikTok is like unveiling a conspiracy. It's like, no, this was literally a congressional hearing. It's just wild to me. So for all of their statements of like, oh, we're not gonna look into UFOs and we don't have the budget mm-hmm. for it. First of all, the biggest lie to ever come out of anyone's mouth is the military saying we don't have the budget for it. What are you talking I mean, about? But they're and- using all that fucking money. That's the thing. They probably don't have the budget because they're mismanaging how they're spending it. That's true. Please but don't hurt me. Anybody? Also- <laughs> I'm scared now that I'm saying. If we bad go things. missing, <laughs> it's the military's fault, and you can't do anything um, about it because. No, but just no, (laughs) but just no. Um, But also like for them to say, oh, we're not going to look into UFOs. And now six months later, it's been proven that not only were they looking into UFOs, they were fully conspiring with UFOs. They were like, they were speaking with extraterrestrials, communicating with extraterrestrials, fucking friendships with aliens or something. So that's um, crazy. Anyway, the, if you ever want to go look at the highlights of that on TikTok, they're all there for you. It's amazing. Um, M sent it to me and my mind was fucking blown. (laughs) So, yeah. Anyway, especially since the congressional hearings um, where government officials straight up told us that aliens are real. Um, And by the way, none of us cared because the world's on fire. That's the best part. You know (laughs) that they wanted us to give a shit. Um, Well, no, they didn't because they did. They posted it on like a Friday night so that nobody would get like primetime news. And so like it just got completely. You're totally right. Rushed aside. They like mm. tried to tried to keep it D on the DL. Well, guess what? It stayed on the DL because everyone heard and went, whatever. <laughs> it, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the skepticism of the findings in Project Blue Book before recently, and the criticisms made by scientists and military personnel, uh, they it continued to fuel these theories that the Air Force, the CIA, and the FBI were covering something up. And Kelsapreze, they were. <laughs> um, but 
Fun fact, now Project Blue Book's records can be accessed in the National Archives. You can go read it yourself <gasps> if you'd like. Kick ass. And many of the reports have been digitized. So I wanted to use those to my advantage with these notes. But honestly, I think a 101 was the perfect way to start this. So I love it. That's Project Blue Book. Wow. Good job, Em. Thank you. That's a, that's a big topic. That's a daunting topic. I think you did a great job. And um, you didn't leave any of us behind in your telling of it so now we're ready for the next we're graduating we're graduating 201 so if, if i find any more we'll have a 201 is it 201 or a 102 i think it's 201 because i think two indicates like it's the next level but then why do we even have the 01 wouldn't it just be level 100 it, level 200 cause like no because i think once you get more detail so like 202 might be project blue book uh I'll look it up later. Something more specific. (laughs) Like if it's like anthropology, it's not like anthropology 101. It's like, and then you have 201, which is the second basic of anthropology. 203 might be like anthropology in this country, like more Mm. specified. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You might be right. You might not. I don't know. I'm probably, I'm probably not. I I do know it it goes 101, 201. I think those are just like the levels. Um, Interesting. Like know. they're the okay. intensity levels, but then the yes, numbers at the yes. end represent the categories. Like which class? Yes, yes, yes. I think that's it. Interesting. I'm pretty interesting. sure. Go Rowdy Raiders. <laughs> my mom's go, a professor. Go buffoonery Buckeyes. <laughs> my mom's a professor. She's probably like, what the fuck, Christina? That's not how it works. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Em, I have a story for you. And it's interesting that yours was kind of, I don't know. I think maybe it's a similar situation where... This is not as much as a deep dive as um, our wonderful researcher, Sersha, and I expected um, because there's just a really, really limited amount of information on it. Mm, Look at us. Look at us just always having (laughs) the same brain. Just, just. (laughs) Two ships in the night, Christine. There we go. Okay. (laughs) Two peas in a pod, peanut butter and jelly. Um, So this is the disappearance of Susan Wolfe. And uh, I just want to write a little note here. Susan Wolf, uh, her legal name when she disappeared was Susan Wolf Kappel, um, but she was in the middle of a very contentious divorce Mm. and her obituary by her family only used her maiden name. So I think we're going to stick with just the maiden name out of respect. Sure. And uh, here we go. This is an Ohio story. Um, Susan Wolf was born March 30th, 1962 to Judy and James or Jim Wolf. And she was born and raised in a town called Newcomers Town, mm. uh, which is in Ohio. It is about an hour and a half northeast of Columbus. And it is in the Appalachian region of Ohio on the Tuscarawas River. It is largely surrounded by forests and farmland and just 20 minutes from Salt Fork, which is like a wildlife area and includes Salt Fork State Park. Uh, So just, you know, kind of out in the boonies, so to speak. For the last several decades, the population of Newcomers Town uh, has hovered pretty steadily around 4,000 residents. So pretty small town. And it's, of course, the sort of place very cliche but where everyone feels a sense of security everyone feels like they know each other um feel people feel safe you know mm-hmm. and we sometimes see that and it's a red flag <laughs> in these yeah, stories I know. nowadays when something's safe i'm like like i kind of wish it would start dangerous just so like yeah i'm on set i'm my, already on edge yes exactly set my that's why i have such a <laughs> what do they say like i i don't know i have that issue where i expect the worst because then if something it happens right. i'm like pleasantly surprised but i'm prepared just in case you know yeah yeah um, yeah so <laughs> that's <laughs> that's kind of kind of how it is uh so people felt like they were safe in this kind of a small rural town susan herself was an active member of the community she was part of the youth ministry at saint paul's lutheran church she was really proud to be in the lutheran church in high school she was a trombone player and a head majorette which is a baton twirler in the school oh, band. I, I control baton. Do you know that? Can you really? Is this part mm-hmm. of clown college? No, it was part of summer camp. Oh. <laughs> I love I how went... many activ- extracurricular activities of yours were like clown related. 
that's fair i probably should i could have used it and but i will say very similarly i so i did baton twirling at summer camp and i did plate spinning in clown college so i feel like there has to be a little crossover with that skill maybe there's maybe there's a, i'm really good with the wrist you know Just yeah there the, you go you got that wrist strength yeah, yeah. that's very powerful skill congratulations thank you Apparently, she was such a good baton twirler that she actually, during high school, began, she got, like, certified somehow and began teaching courses at, like, a dance school in town. So she was, um, you know, not to put you on blast, M, but very good at oh, baton twirling. Sh- okay. Okay. <laughs> like, relax. It's fine. Yeah. My bad. She also <laughs> led her own group called the Purple Riderettes. Okay, girl. The Rowdy yeah. Riderettes. The Rowdy Riderettes. That's good. So in her senior year of high school in 1980, Susan was very surprised to discover she was pregnant. So she had been dating this guy, um, but the pregnancy came as a surprise. And, you know, like happened so often back in the day, uh, she married her boyfriend because of this situation. What you had to do. What you had to do. And her boyfriend's name was Alan Kappel, and they had a son named Damon. And Susan absolutely adored Damon. He was her whole life. But unfortunately, Susan and Alan's relationship uh, was not happy. I mean, they got married when she was 17 and he was 19, and they immediately had a kid together. Like, the Mm -hmm. amount of pressure and, like, getting roped into something so young, I imagine, is just very difficult. Mm -hmm. So they had a very contentious relationship. Susan left him three times during their relationship. And the third and final time she left was early 1982. So this was about two years into their marriage. She was only 19 years old. Susan showed up at her parents' house with nothing but the clothes on her back. And she told her parents, she and Alan were filing for divorce. And she said, you know what? I'll do whatever I have to. I'll go on welfare if I need to. And her parents said, no, no, we'll take care of you and Damon. Like we'll, we'll make sure you're taken care of. So Susan, of course, wanted to provide for Damon. So she started structuring her life to allow for that. And what she would do is two nights a week, she would commute 45 minutes to uh, work at a hospital in Canton, Ohio. And uh, that job would soon become full time. And she was really excited for for that to be like a full time career for her. But until then, she decided to take a second part time job at the IGA grocery store in Newcomerstown. So Susan was working toward a goal of being financially independent from Alan, uh, especially because the divorce divorce was uh, upcoming and she Mm -hmm. wanted to have a chance at custody of their son. This was tough because, of course, along with uh, a heated divorce often comes a heated custody battle. And Alan at this point had temporary custody and full control over whether Susan could see her son. So she felt like she needed to it was she felt like it was an basically an uphill battle to try and get custody of her son but she was going to try as hard as she possibly could so one day when susan was supposed to pick damon up to spend time with him alan just flat out refused to meet with Mm. her and said never mind you can't see your son and (laughs) she flipped out class act exactly she flipped out she was like you know what she called her attorney she said i'm done with this and her attorney said well the good news is we are ready to get this custody hearing going and a date has been set. Ooh, okay. And yes, this was a big deal. Custody proceedings had already been delayed twice, so she felt like this was just an ongoing. She just couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel until now. So she was absolutely thrilled. She told her mom, she told Judy, Mom, it's the best news. I'm so happy. And this part <laughs> makes me tear up, but she spent the rest of the day she bought paint to paint her ch- own childhood bedroom for her for her son oh and um she said this is going to be our room we're going to sleep here and uh the room had been painted orange when she was in high school and now she went out and bought green paint and spent the day painting the room to prepare for Damon's arrival after the custody hearing which like just tears my heart into pieces mm-hmm. so She was in her parents' stable home, two jobs under the roof, uh, you know, two incomes, basically, uh, a safe place to be, a family, lots of people to watch him. She was like, this is perfect. They're definitely going to grant me custody. She told a friend, I have good news. I finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. So she was just felt like she was finally turning a corner. Yeah. 
So just before leaving for her 4 p.m. shift at IGA, Susan was in very high spirits. Um, She told her mom, I will be at that custody hearing. Mm -hmm. And those were unfortunately some of the last words Judy Wolf ever heard from her daughter. Oh. Yeah. So at 6 p.m., Susan's dad, which I think this is very adorable, stopped in at the grocery store deli to get dinner and see his daughter at work. Like he That is a very in. dad thing to do. Isn't that cute? I thought so, too. Like, I'll just pop in, grab a ham sandwich and say hi. Uh, so he went and, and saw her and she was halfway through her shift. Um, so her shift ended at nine. He went to go get dinner. He saw Susan's car, the family car out in the parking lot said hi to his daughter, um, and said, I'll see you, you know, when you get home. But once he got home, 9 p.m. came and went, and Susan didn't arrive home. She only lived a mile away. Her parents only lived a mile away from the grocery store, and it would have only taken a a matter of minutes to drive home, and she had the car at work. So it was very odd that she didn't come home shortly after 9. And it wasn't like her to just go make plans with friends last mm-hmm. minute and not tell her parents so they were let's just say uncomfy they were like something is not right but we're gonna wait it out and hope that she just forgot to tell us where she was she also had just gone to work with her uniform and did not bring her purse or wallet with her so essentially like if she was out running errands she didn't have her purse she didn't have her wallet right didn't, she didn't have a change of clothes it just didn't make sense yeah it doesn't make sense and she was last seen wearing her she was wearing her iga apron so it's not like she was going out with friends without a wallet and a change of clothes or whatever so just very odd um judy later said in an interview we just had a horrible night that night i was like i don't know what's happened jim we didn't know but i felt something horrible had probably happened Mm, just like a gut feeling just a gut feeling and it's it must be so scary because it's just nighttime and there's nothing you can do you're like yeah. do i go to sleep do i like drive around looking do i call the police and, but they're gonna and say when like, you have one of those gut feelings like they they're not fucking around a lot of the time no. so if i ever had a gut feeling like you're an I intuition would freak the in. fuck out i would be yeah. like what is going on it, yeah oh my god and so no you're just sitting there and there's nothing you can do you're like just waiting which is just my least favorite thing to do as a, an extremely <laughs> impatient person so I can't even imagine. Um, still, Susan was a young adult. She was under a lot of stress, as we covered. And, you know, it was possible she had made last minute plans with friends and lost track of time. So her parents were trying to convince themselves, like, maybe this is just her letting off some steam. But, of course, the morning came and Susan still wasn't home. So the Wolves called IGA and got in touch with another woman who had worked uh, the same shift as Susan that night. And she said, oh, I saw her leaving her shift leaving after work and they asked her to tell the story she said the two of us were chatting in the parking lot i was waiting for my husband to come pick me up and susan was headed toward her car when a rusty blue car that seemed like an older model pulled into the parking lot and drove up besides susan Mm. susan talked to the person and then looked back at her friend and apparently made a disgusted expression as though she were, like, disliking the person in the car. Yeah. Uh, almost, I imagine it as just like an ugh, like an eye roll, you know, yeah, to your friend. Yeah. Like, uh, this guy again. So even though the friend didn't see who was in the car, she said she definitely knew the driver. Because after making this kind of face at her friend, she hopped into the passenger seat. Oh. And they drove away. So we don't know what was said. We don't know who was the, who the driver was. We assume she knew him. Um, right, for, to just get in the car. To just hop in the car, you know. Also, like, for it to be a, a disgusted eye roll look, it's like, you have to be pretty close because that's like, that seems exactly. like a, a chummy thing to do. Yes, and it feels like a, ugh, like, I dislike this person so much that i'm willing to make a face right in front of them <laughs> like you know yeah to say, Ew, well I like i would guy. roll my eyes at you or something like i feel like you have to be like pretty close for that yeah yeah exactly so like was, i wouldn't do that with a friend i just met because we're not that that close right I, yeah i'm okay with looking like an asshole <laughs> exactly because then you do look like an asshole you know yeah. so it it's bizarre because she then got in the car so they must have said something even though she didn't like them to convince mm-hmm. her to get in the car 
and there was no like gun or knife, you know, so it wasn't like she was forced into the car. Right. Um, she went willingly, which was very odd. So, you know, the parents hear this and they're immediately confused. Um, but they thought of Alan. So this is uh, uh, Susan's husband. Right. who's They're right. in the process of divorcing. Alan's friend, Rick Parrish, owned an old blue car. And they were like, huh, well, they're really close. Like, maybe it was him. Mm. Uh, you know, we'll figure it out. So or they maybe it was, to the pl- Sorry, I was just saying, maybe it was Alan borrowing Rick's car. Exactly. That is another, that's a very strong possibility as well. So they reached out to police who, you know, weren't really concerned. Um, Susan was 19. She was under a lot of stress. Maybe she just wanted to get away for a bit. Uh, but none of this added up. Again, she wouldn't have just left town uh, with in her uniform with no purse, no wallet no id without telling it she had uncashed paychecks at home like it just didn't make sense so above all else judy and jim were like uh this custody hearing is extremely important to her it's coming up in three weeks there is no way in hell she was just gonna leave town and miss the custody hearing right so jim drove to iga and unfortunately i imagine his heart must have sunk because susan's car was still sitting in the parking lot and he she was nowhere to be found so he contacted police who gave him permission to take it home which he did so susan's family didn't know what else to do so they basically started making flyers which i think is like what else can you do Mm -hmm. so they get help from others who are putting flyers up out of state they're trying to get people who are leaving town to like bring flyers with them and kind of spread them throughout the area and calls pretty quickly started coming in with sightings and tips and Jim uh, recorded every single phone call just in case. Mm-hmm. So the wolves were offering a $20,000 reward for information, which uh, today is approximately $64,000. And I think, I think the $20,000 reward came up. I think it increased to that eventually. I don't think it was 20,000 okay. right off the bat, but it eventually became a $20,000 reward for any information leading to Susan's whereabouts. The wolves traveled across the country from New Jersey to Las Vegas, following all the tips they could. Um, But every single one was a dead end. There was even a postal worker who delivered mail to a woman in Pittsburgh named Susan Wolf, but spelled differently. Mm. And he called in a tip. And so they went to Pittsburgh. Her parents went to Pittsburgh and met this woman. But it just happened to be another woman named Susan Wolf. Um, And it was not the same, which must have been heartbreaking. So during the search, Judy said in an interview, if Susan is dead, I can deal with that. I don't want to, but I can. We have places for birth and death, but where do you put that missing person? So it's that same thing we see over and over again, like the the lack of closure and how painful it is to not know whether yeah. someone has died and not be able to close a chapter, give them a burial, put them to rest. It's yeah. just this like constant waiting game and it like drains people. It's torture. Like, to- yeah. Torture. Torture. In 1983, a Greyhound bus driver picked up a woman in Cleveland headed south and she requested to be dropped off at a gas station in Newcomerstown. But he said, no, that's not the official bus stop and that place is closed. So you got to wait till we get to the official bus stop. Apparently, when she got off the bus, she began running back toward that closed gas station and the driver thought that's a little bit odd and at the freaking bus stop there was a missing poster sign and (gasps) or miss yeah of her and he looked at the photo and said oh my god that looks just like this woman that just ran ran off the bus yeah and so he said she was acting strange she was traveling with one single satchel even though she had started the trip in reno nevada so like what she was traveling cross country with like barely anything and she was headed toward the gas station where Rick Parrish, Alan's friend, had worked at the time of her disappearance. Oh, interesting. Just a little bit odd. So the bus driver alerted the authorities, but they did an extensive search of the area and found nothing. No sign of her or no sign of the woman that uh, could have been her. Like she just kept running off? or just... Yeah, they, she must have uh, slipped out of the area or oh. hid under the radar, yeah. So once authorities reassessed the details of Susan's disappearance, they finally got involved, but they really didn't do much of a large-scale investigation or search effort, and the police have gotten a lot of flack from people all over the country for how much they botched this investigation. Mm. Um, 
Judy and Jim were convinced that Alan, Alan's friend Rick Parrish, and his cousin Robert Kelly Parrish were responsible or at least involved somehow in Susan's disappearance. They just thought it is a little too coincidental for this nasty divorce to be going on. The custody hearing is set that day, and then she vanishes in a blue car. They were like, we think her ex is involved and his friend Rick and his blue car that was yeah. our theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, it's a good theory. <laughs> I think so. I think it's definitely the strongest possibility at this point. But yeah. get this. Two weeks after Susan vanished, Rick and his cousin Kelly were killed in a car accident in the blue. What? Park. Yeah. And so Ew. that lead was just like gone. And there is speculation online about like, do did somebody cut the brakes? Did somebody, but apparently right. it really was just an accident. They like r- oh, rolled shit. off an embankment and were killed. Um, it's almost like somebody in a comment on a forum said like it, karma got them immediately. <laughs> like if oh, they wow. did do it, like karma got them immediately because they were killed within two weeks. Yeah. Um. So, you know, if they did know anything about Susan's whereabouts, they most likely took it to their graves, um, okay. which would have just been, so my first thought too was someone cut the brakes or like yeah it's a very weird coincidence Mm -hmm. okay you know no way to really know but apparently according to the i don't know paperwork it was just a cut and dry accident but who knows yeah so the wolves describe the official investigation as a very frustrating experience um, which i would say is putting it mildly and many including myself say it was downright botched Um, Unfortunately, we don't have many details regarding the investigation because, fun fact, uh, all the investigation documents, transcripts, and the original prosecutor's file were somehow lost after uh, a couple years. They just vanished. Mm. Um, And then that happened again. So they've lost. That's very interesting. Just vanishing. Just piecing on out. And nobody seems to know where they are. So basically, the information is, it hadn't been digitized, obviously. This was back in the 80s. So It's just lost to time, which is infuriating. Mm -hmm. Alan maintained his innocence, of course. Um, He said he was certain Susan was alive somewhere, and he said he expected her to knock on his door one day, and he'd just ask her where she'd been. And her parents were like, yeah, I mean, that'd be fucking nice, but... I I don't know many times that that's happened ever, but... um... Likely story. Okay. And (sighs) the plot... But why would she even go to him? Like, she's, they're right? divorcing. <laughs> yeah, like, back off. Yeah, that's interesting. Weird. So Alan was eventually granted his divorce and custody of Damon. This was a year Ugh. after Susan vanished. I know. Um, despite the wolf's efforts to seek grandparents' custody rights, I think that's a pretty difficult thing to pull off unless you have, like, very, very strong evidence or reasoning, reasoning. Yeah, or evidence. So he got custody, and within five months, he was remarried. And in 2003, now this was 21 years after Susan was last seen, he also died in a car accident. What the hell's going on? I don't know. It's weird, right? Okay. so I find it weird. Everyone's just like, yep. I'm like, it seems bizarre to me, but whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Um, If he was involved in whatever happened to Susan, of course, now... That door is closed, and police had not taken the time to really thoroughly investigate him, so too late wild. now, he's dead. Wild that they could never, or that they never looked into the person she was having a custody battle with. Hello? Whose like best friend was, like, a suspect, or the car. Drove least, a blue car. I don't, I mean botched you said botched earlier that's a great word because like yeah how did you miss this or how do you just not care enough and also like it's always careless the 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 like what's the knee-jerk thought is always it's the ex it's the the husband did it yeah the husband did it the spouse did it so like how would you not even start there you'd think so and it's just really frustrating there have been theories floated around that maybe alan had like an in with the cops and maybe or whoever did it maybe had an in with the cops and kept it on the dl Mm -hmm. there was also i think it's also just frustrating because of the way they treated the family like her parents right 
so infuriating to listen to and read about the way that they just were so dismissive and didn't give them any information like they were doing all the legwork but the police just didn't even you know well you even said earlier that like they like the dad got permission to drive the car home it's like they didn't even look into the car they didn't Mm -hmm. even i mean like i I and they could have they could have examined the blue car that the cousins drove right that rick drove but uh two weeks later it was totaled so they had those two weeks to take a peek to interview the cousin did they just did they ever make a statement about like why they just didn't give a shit or like no not really um not really there's not much reasoning to be heard um and for a while the parents uh judy and jim were taking note or having their friends call anytime they saw like a blue a rusty blue older car that fit the description Mm -hmm. and they were writing down the license plates apparently they called police and told them that and they were like oh we don't keep track of any of that and they were like we've been like they just were doing all this work and then the police would just kind of put a block up you know like no that's not gonna no we're not doing that um and so just say you don't care like just say exactly (laughs) right you have no reason to not do your job it's pretty obvious i mean it's just infuriating i'm not you know probably doing it justice how much shit parents got um like just total what a word i heard in one podcast was uh (laughs) did you hear what Christine, what's the word? I'm having a brain fog moment again. That my mom brain fog. Um, oh, uh, Murphy's Law. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, Murphy's, Murphy's Law, Law, where it was like, uh, you know, everything that can go wrong will, and it did in this case. It was almost like comical if it if there were anything funny about it. But unfortunately, you know, there's obviously, yeah. It's actually just sad. Murphy's it's Law. It's actually just yeah, horrible. Um, but it's true. Think- I mean, like, I don't, I. I have yet to hear you talk about one way that it was properly investigated. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, per- exactly. Or and investigated at all, not even properly. Like, they just all. didn't even give a shit. Not even a first step. And so uh, if you do want to hear more, Trace Evidence Podcast did a really good, episode, like, thorough covering of the case. That's where I heard the Murphy's Law comment, and I fully agree. Um, and he kind of goes over, like, in much finer detail, like, the minutia of the quote unquote investigation all that so if you are Mm. interested you can uh i watched it on youtube but you can also listen to that so anyway this is all just a big mess as you can imagine and alan then also dies in a car accident and now that door is closed as well right so although susan's case isn't you know as well known or as widespread as others it has compelled people for 41 years because it's just so jarring like she just vanished and so in 2006 users created a thread on websleuths.com to try and share information and theories it's sort of like a forum where you can Mm -hmm. chat back and forth with other people and one user shared an article about the cold case unit of the kentucky society of professional investigators and the article came from kentucky post and featured a team of private investigators who were dedicated to taking on cold cases that were at least 20 years old And they had read about the wolf story. And even though it wasn't in Kentucky and it was actually like not even in Cincinnati, it was farther north. They were so compelled by apparently it was the photo of the parents on the um, on one of the articles that that compelled them to decide that the wolf's case was their first case, their first cold case they were going to look into. Oh, wow. Okay. So they pursued every lead they could. Um, They were in contact with the wolf's. They said they will not be charging them a single dime for their help because they've already spent so much money on private investigators. On (laughs) at least someone's being nice to them. I know it's about time. So unfortunately, the link to the original article is defunct, and like we can't find any. Like Sersha and I both looked. Like you cannot find any more information. Really, I was even on the Wayback Mm. Machine, like trying to dig around. There's just not much about it online, unfortunately. Still, people continue to update the thread, and actually the latest post was Thursday as these notes were getting done. Somebody actually commented during that time. Um, And so people are still, you know, trying to get to the bottom of it. So I'm I'm really hoping. It it feels like such a 
un- such an unlikely scenario, but I really hope that something, some hint comes forward. And people say like, oh, well, it died with Alan if he did know anything, but maybe not. Maybe he said something to somebody and yeah. maybe he let it slip at one point when he had a few too many drinks or maybe who knows, but I feel like there has to be somebody out there who might have a clue or they couldn't guess. even like they couldn't even get a warrant and like blacklight his clothes for blood or something like I don't I feel like there's I mean not, I mean she's clearly alive if she ran off the bus right but the, like was that even well, her I don't know but probably not you know I mean probably yeah. not yeah there were so it, many sightings and even though that one was like a a compelling one it right. doesn't necessarily prove anything and you know maybe she, the person on the bus just had an uncanny resemblance to her you know yeah and it just happened to be at frick's mm-hmm. car i mean it, it's 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 all so weird and like man they man i don't know like like was there any i don't know i'm trying to like olivia benson this and be like what what sideways could they have taken but I know. they could have taken anyway and it would have been better so I know, I know. And the saddest part is this year it's been 41 years since her disappearance. Mm. And think about how old that makes her son. He's in his yeah. 40s now. Yeah, so oh, poor guy. It's just, it's just crazy. So in March of 2022, uh, 40 years since they last saw their daughter, Judy told the Times reporter, we still think there's a good possibility that she may be alive somewhere. Now that doesn't make sense, but it does to me because I don't know what's going to happen. I had a time there when it first happened that I thought, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep praying because it's not helping. But that didn't last very long. Mm. But they did eventually seek closure a few years ago. In late 2014, they decided to begin proceedings to declare Susan legally deceased. And uh, Damon, who was 34 at the time, did not attend. The court granted their request, and the wolves were able to hold an official service and erect a gravestone for Susan. And the gravestone has her name, and then the two names next to it are her mom and dad. So for when they pass. Yeah. It's always horrible to see, like, parents still living on the gravestone on the child dawn. Mm -hmm. It's just a horrible sight. So they held a celebration of life service for Susan on June 6th, which was an important date for them because it was the day that she had been confirmed into her Lutheran church in 1976 and uh, as a teenager. And that was a, just a really special day for her and a special Mm -hmm. day for the whole family. So they decided to do it that day and they published an obituary, which spoke of Susan's brothers, aunts and uncles who miss her as well as her nieces and nephews that she never got the chance to meet. And the obituary ended with Susan's favorite Bible verse, which she and her mother picked out together years ago for her confirmation on that day. Hmm. Um, The Bible quote is, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So today the wolves still hope that they'll one day find the ultimate closure and have some truth. But uh, for the time being, they are just trying to, you know, live one day at a time. They're in their 80s now. Um, so, uh, you know, we can only hope that some information comes through that gives them some answers before they pass. But, um, I like to think that at least when they pass, they'll be reunited, but yeah, I don't know. Um, that is the story. I'm going to give you a quick, I took a screenshot of her stats, like, um, just in case, you know, if anyone has any information. Yeah. So let's see. Susan Wolf Kappel was 19 years old when she went missing. Oh, she was only 19. Think about that. Sorry. That oh, took me by God. surprise again. In my mind, she was like our age. Yeah. So I know. I know. So, so many of the photos that are posted are like age progressions of her. So I forget how young she was when she actually passed or yeah. disappeared. I'm sorry. Susan Wolf Kappel was 19 years old when she went missing in 1982. She has brown eyes and brown hair, and at the time of her disappearance, she was 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed 107 pounds. She was last seen wearing a white and brown striped turtleneck sweater, brown corduroy jeans, a red IGA smock, and reddish-brown Oxfords. Her upper left front tooth was discolored, and she has a scar on the upper right side of her lip. She had previously fractured her nose in a car accident. If you have any information about Susan... And um, you can call the sheriff's office, uh, the 
Tuscarawas County Sheriff's Office or the Newcomers Town Police Department. But I have heard also that the family likes to receive the tips mm, themselves yeah. so that they well, can follow up. Honestly, you're, you have better luck with telling the family. It sounds right. Like. It seems so. like they have good reason for that. So I would I would go that route instead and maybe research how to get in touch with them if you have any information. And, you know, anything's worth sharing, as I always say, like you never know what might help. And actually, yeah. the, the woman at, who worked with her at IGA actually ended up doing a hypnosis to try and recall any more details about the car, oh, wow. the blue car. And she nothing came up during the hypnosis either so the right. families worked with psychics i mean they've tried so much and spent so much money trying to get to the bottom of it and have had zero answers it must imagine just be their anger with the police yeah heartbreaking i can't imagine infuriating so that's the story and that's why Whee! we drink so <laughs> and that's yeah. why we drink indeed that's... um geez oh my gosh yeah it's well pretty sad yeah I thought you said that that story um, didn't have a lot of information, but it sounded like it did. I mean, it should yes. have more, but, you know. Well, yeah, I was talking to Search about it, and it was sort of like all the legal stuff has vanished. Like, all the prosecutor information, all the fi police files, they got lost. So, like, mm. we don't have any official paperwork about it, you know? There are, like, articles, and the family has talked a lot, but there's just a lack of official documentation on it. Um, so it's just a bummer. Mm. Well, good storytelling anyway, Christine. Thank you, Em. You and your tank top and your broad shoulders, apparently. <laughs> all did it. Y'all did a good job. Ooh, la la. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, what are you doing for the rest of the day? Great question. Um, probably just continuing to clean and clean and prep for the partay. Oh, yeah. What, what do you, do you have left? I also am cleaning. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> what's your, uh, what's like um, the big overwhelming thing that you're oh. trying to get done before your party? Just cleaning. Like, my mom came over and was like, look at the couch. And it has this, like, giant stain all over it. And I'm like, that's so gross. So now <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to clean the fucking upholstery on the couch. Just stupid shit like that. Um, oh, I wanted to say, though, I actually... Um, have a quick little shout out because when we were on tour or no i'm sorry it was beach <laughs> sandy was on tour but we got a set of cookies from someone called the kitchen witch and i remember thinking like oh my god what an amazing username and company name and so i reached out to them because i just thought they did such a good job with the cookies and i said would you be willing to make cookies for leona's party oh. and yeah, she wrote to me today and said, I'm shipping them today and here's a little sneak peek. And they have like oh, little they're the hungry they're all the aren't fruits. They cute? And, foods. Oh, and they have like amazing. little holes in them. I'm so oh, excited. Like the little caterpillar. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited about it. So I just wanted to give her a shout out. Um she's at I think the username or the account is uh Kitchen Witch or at Kitchen Witch. I will I will make sure we post oh Kitchen Witch Cookie Co. And um, I swear to God, like one of the most impressive des like hand designed cookies I've ever seen in my life. So I just want to give her a shout out. Um, the little holes yeah. in the cookie, like the caterpillar got is that not them, so is cute? <laughs> precious. Did you ever get all your items back? I did. They came already. Um, and I was cracking up. I told my mom, I was like, okay, watch this and pretend like I just stole this off someone's porch and I'm looking to make money <laughs> off it. The first thing I pull out is a three and a half foot cardboard caterpillar. <laughs> I was like, this idiot's going to be so mad when he gets like a bunch of little felt apples and a four foot caterpillar he's oh gonna not know what to do are so you, i did I, get it all back thank you for i asking. definitely want pictures i want to see what this uh i want to see what the setup looks like i will take pictures for sure and we can post them and i'll tag uh i'll tag kitchen witch what's she gonna but, wear um, at her party um i don't know i'm kind of freaking out about that because i was gonna make a shirt like with my cricket machine but i'm just running out of time is there like a caterpillar outfit you can just get just, online for her to wear yeah maybe they have some she on etsy but they probably won't come in time i, I mean know. she is the hungry caterpillar right 
Yeah, she is the hungry caterpillar indeed. Very, very hungry. It'd be very, very sweet. I don't know. I don't know. It'll it'd be cool if you got her a whole little caterpillar tail and it just wagged behind her all day. <laughs> <laughs> and just little antenna. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, I hope you have fun. I'm sorry I can't be there. I know. We'll miss you. And the food well, there'll be so much food, Em. That'll miss you too. Everyone else will finally have a chance to eat something at your house because I'm right. not there to stop it. So, <laughs> <have a> chance. <laughs> oh, well, and that's why we drink. <laughs>